Mary Ellen Crosley is a scientific and botanical illustrator, as well as an art educator. A former practicing architect, she has illustrated eight books and numerous articles for national and international journals. So with that, welcome Mary Ellen. Thank you, Libby. It's so nice to be here and welcome to my studio. I hope it's a beautiful day as it is here, wherever you are. And I wanna thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedule for joining the class this morning. So let's go ahead and begin. Okay, so I'm going to switch now to my desk camera. So I'm gonna go away, but you'll still hear my voice. And uh, we're, I'm gonna to switch to my desk camera and we're gonna to start to talk about a quick overview of how to set up your desk when you're getting ready to work and also about the media and the materials that we're gonna be using, okay? So let me go ahead and switch. It might take me a moment to adjust, so I hope I don't give anybody vertigo as I do this. Okay, I'm gonna zoom way out on my camera here for a moment so you can kind of see what I have. I've got my watercolor pad here. I'm gonna shift my camera over just a little bit so you can see I have all of my references over here. On, I'm right-handed, so I keep my references on the left-hand side. I've got my watercolor pad in the center. And then you'll see over here on the right-hand side, I have my palette. Uh, let's see, my palette. I don't want to give everybody, make everybody sick here. I've also got my, my water available. I keep a handy pencil sharpener as well as a container to hold all my shavings and any of the graphite that gets loose. I also have some paper, some absorbent paper napkins. I'm really fond of the luncheon and dinner napkins that you can find. These are usually really inexpensive in the grocery store aisle, uh, in the paper aisle in the grocery store. I usually have one or two of those available for for blotting and uh, with my brush. And then of course, I'm gonna have my palette. So now we'll get to the specifics of each one as we go along, okay? I also have available, I, I also have at the ready, a pencil. Now I do wanna mention today for online purposes, okay? I use a, I typically use an HB or an H pencil. Okay, now what does that mean? So most of us are familiar with a 2H pencil and you'll notice that both of these pencils, we have the indication of the graphite, of the type of graphite that's inside or the type of lead that's inside. And um, it's so that we know which one, which one is which. Now, basically the harder the pencil and always think of H as hard, the higher the number, the harder the pencil. This means that the mixture of clay and graphite and binder, that there's less graphite for more clay and binder, the harder the pencil is. So what does that mean? That means that for the same amount of pressure, I get a lighter line with an H pencil than I do with, with a 2H pencil than I do with an HB pencil. So I always like to think of B as bold and H as hard, and that helps me remember which one is going to help me make a lighter line and which one's gonna help me make a darker line. Generally, when we're doing watercolor, when we're creating a, a drawing for watercolor, we wanna use a hard pencil, a 2H pencil. However, experience has taught me that that doesn't show up very well in an online format. So you're gonna see me using a B pencil uh, in this case. So we have a nice, we have nice bold uh, and, and dark rich values so that you can see the lines and you can see our values really well over, uh, over our format today. Now, the fundamentals of all of, of, of any kind of artwork that you're going to create, particularly when we're dealing when we're dealing with realistic subject matter, is you need to think about the, think about whatever your subject is reduced down to fundamental platonic shapes. So you'll see here, because this is our reference photograph, okay, and I'll zoom out just a little bit. Some of you might be familiar with this if, if you had a chance to check it out on our website. So we've got our, we've got our hummingbird here. 
It's a similar photograph to a composition. Our composition is slightly changed. Um, and so, but this is a, a nice reference for us. And one of the things that we want to do when we look at this for the first time, especially if we haven't had the chance to have as much experience as we would like drawing, this can be overwhelming. There are all of these very organic shapes and these sort of structural connections that it's really difficult sometimes to wrap your mind around. What I want you to think about is think about our subject matter always as basic shapes. So if we look at our, if we, if we, you know, if we look at our subject, we want to think of it just as big shapes. So let's first think about our trumpet flower. Okay, so I'm going to remove this here. And when we think about the trumpet flower, right, we have, we have basically, we need to be dealing with a sphere and a cone, okay? And when we think about sketching out our sphere or cone, when we do this, we think about the light coming from a single direction. Typically, if you're a right-handed artist, you want the light to be coming from the upper left-hand corner. So even though even even though you know when we get out into the in into the natural world it can be overwhelming because there's all kinds of light and shadows and things but reduce your subject down to seeing it just as basic big basic shapes so when we look at even uh, when when we look at this flower over here we can think of it as a cone as a basic disk and then ultimately, when we get down to the more complicated, to the, to the stem of it, we can deal with that sphere. So let's take that apart one by one. Let's start with a sphere. So with the sphere, and I'm going to zoom down. Again, I hope I don't give anybody kind of a mild vertigo. This is why I could never play uh, digital games. It bothers me when screens move. So I apologize if I'm giving you a little vertigo there. But so here we are now. So we're looking at this basic, our, our basic sphere. And what we want to think about, and what I'll do is we want to think about the, the turning shadow, the cast shadow, and any kind of contrast between the highlight and the background. So let's do that together. So I'm going to come down here to where I've started with a basic sphere. And what we're going to do is remember that that light is coming from a single direction. We're gonna simplify any lighting situation. We have a lighted side of the sphere and we have a darker side of the sphere. And I'm going to put in a basic value. Notice that when I'm putting in value, this is always a good habit when you're drawing, that when you're adding value, you just keep consistent, boring lines. You do not want interesting lines like that. The, the eye likes to follow that. So what you wanna do is make a very consistent pattern. And then that way, when you blend, you'll have a nice consistent value. Now, what happens in light in, in with, with values on three-dimensional forms is we always have something called a reflected light and a turning shadow because the, the side facing the light is going to be where we're going to have our highest highlight. But remember, this sphere is turning away. So we'll have a little bit of shadow over here. And as it begins to turn away, the surface of the sphere begins to turn away from the light source. It gets increasingly, but, but gently, in a subtle way, it gets a little bit darker. Now, at the point where the sphere turns completely away, the surface of the sphere is completely turned from the light source, we get what's called a turning shadow. This is, this is actually the darker part of the shadow. And then something rather counterintuitive happens. We would think that because the, 
the point on the sphere that is furthest from the light source, that would be the darkest area, but in fact, it's not. What happens is we have a what's called a reflected light, and you'll see I'm using a small eraser to take out some of that graphite, and then on the cast shadow, the cast shadow is always darkest, closest to the object, and then cast shadows fade as they move away from the object and their edges soften. You'll notice I'm not using my finger to blend in order to get this effect. Very important if you are doing a full graphite underdrawing for your, for your watercolor, not to use your fingers. You have natural oils on your fingers. And as we know, oil and water do not mix. And you can actually create a spot on your paper where the watercolor will simply bead off. So if you're going to be blending and having any kind of values that are in graphite underneath your watercolor, it's a very 18th to 19th century method in watercolor to do that. And um, when you do that, you just wanna make sure that you use one of these paper stumps Okay, it's simply a coil of paper, and you can see how I'm using the tip to blend. So now we have that, you'll notice we have the highlight. Okay, this is our turning shadow. I'll learn how to spell turning, <laughs> Saturday morning. <laughs> And then this is our cast shadow. And you'll notice the cast shadow is usually a bit elongated. Mary Ellen, we are losing a little bit of the text that you're writing. It's, um, oh. if you could move your, your paper over to the, yeah, thank you. There we go. Thank you, Libby, for keeping me <laughs> in focus. So here's our cast shadow. Good, I hope that helps everyone. So the next thing we can do is we wanna think about how the, values are in the background. So we always want to have a little bit of contrast, right, to make that to make that object pop and to also give it a sense of so this is when we have contrast always makes things sparkle that always catches our eye, the human eye. So when we have something light next to something darker, we tend to look at it. So this is a way as an artist that you can create interest and emphasis in your work. And so when we have this and a little bit of this contrast in the back, now it looks like our sphere is occupying space. We don't have to be very specific about that space if we don't want to. Um, and as a matter of fact, you probably don't want to. You want to keep the detail pretty minimal for any background that you have so that it looks so that it doesn't detract from your main subject. Now, one of the things you'll notice about is I use a variety of values and that gives us an opportunity to talk about a value scale, okay? So the value scale is the darkness, the darkest and the lightest value that you can get from whatever medium that you're working in, whether that be watercolor or graphite or charcoal or whatever. So one of the things that's always a good idea to do is to sort of test that value scale to, with your medium on a scrap piece of paper, the exact same kind of paper that you're going to be using and see how dark is dark. And by doing this, I want to, I, I want to just caution, caution you that it's important to layer your media, but not pressure your media, especially in watercolor. You do not want to bear down with the tip of the pencil onto your paper, because what will happen is you'll actually create a divot or like a valley in the paper. It's actually called scarring the paper and or scarring the tooth. The tooth is the natural texture of the paper. And you want to make sure that you don't overwork your medium so much on the paper that you create that you um, create a different texture on top of or scar the paper um, so when you do that. So gently have patience and just gently layer your media to get those 
that variety of values. Now, one of the things that happens often in drawings and or in painting in, and in paintings, we're going to be connecting value to hue in just a moment. But one of the things that often happens is you look at your drawing and and it, it's it's to use a to, to use a popular term, it's meh. It's just somewhere there's just no sparkle, no zing to it. And that is usually the situation is, is when you have too many of your values are in the middle scale zone rather than having a darkest dark and a lightest light. So what you want to do is you want to make sure that you go back into that drawing and really create those points of contrast, which, as I said, give you visual interest and also help to find the form. Because remember, when we're drawing and painting realistically, we're actually acting like translators of a language. We are translating something that has moved us to create a work of art, a subject that's uh, moved us to create a work of art. It is a three-dimensional experience that we're seeing, but we want to translate that and share that in a two-dimensional format. And we don't want to lose anything in the translation. So we want to make sure that we include as much information as possible in that. Now, so what I do, what I'm doing here is I'm actually, I have all of my, I have all of my basic forms for my trumpet flower. And I'm just very quickly doing little sketches to kind of get my mind right about what, how those forms behave in a very non-complicated, right, in a single lighting source. So I am taking my cone now. And I'm thinking about my cone and how that behaves. Mary, doing my as you're as you're doing this, uh, someone asked if you don't have the blending stump, the paper stump, and mm -hmm. don't, you don't want people to use their finger. What else could you use to blend with? You could take a Q-tip and you could clip the fuzzy end off on one end. That's a great question. Um, and uh, you just clip it off on one end and then you could use either the fuzzy end or the little paper tip, whichever works best for you. Thank you. Yes. And stump, stumps are stumps are super inexpensive, but they're not they're not ready, you know, because so much is online now. You know, there used to be a little art shop pretty much in every you know in every area you'd be able to find some little art shop with it um it stumps are not as easy to find as they used to be you can order them online they're you know the postage will cost you more than the actual stumps <laughs> so if you don't want to do that you could just do the q-tip trick and and do that so and you'll see like i'm thinking while i'm doing this this gives me a chance to think about my subject to think about how it behaves under the light. And so I'm getting more and more comfortable with what is actually what I'm going to be painting. So if you feel yourself, you know, rusty or overwhelmed, this is how you're going to want to approach your subject. You want to break it down into those big shapes and then, you know, take some scrap paper. I'm actually working on the same paper that I'm going to be painting on. So no surprises. Um, I, uh, and just, I will mention uh, a few brand names as I'm going along. Uh, just to be clear, I, I, I'm not sponsored by any art supply companies or anything. I'm simply mentioning the things that work well for me uh, and, uh, and the, the things that are just a preference of mine after years of practice. Uh, but you should do you. And I encourage you to uh, to try out different papers, to try out different uh, different media's and different brands. Uh, and I would caution you though to um, stay away, especially if you're just starting out, 
to stay away from the extremes, um, stay away from extremely inexpensive media and materials, and stay away from extremely expensive media and materials. Uh, just keep it middle of the road for a little while. Uh, the reason why you don't want to use the um, the really expensive stuff is because um, there's a tendency when you're first starting out to kind of overuse materials and it could get very expensive very quickly. And you don't want to use um, sort of, I, I would say, you know, school grade um, it, it, the, uh, and when I say school grade, I mean like elementary school grade um, materials. You don't want to use those because sometimes the materials and the media can, you can't get the, they just simply can't give you the effect that you want and you're sort of working against the media. So one thing I want to mention about, about, uh, about cylinders as you're watching me draw this cylinder Remember, I always put my arrow there to remind me where my light source is. Cylinders do something a little bit counterintuitive as well, where if it's an open cylinder, there's a dark shadow on the lightest side, correct? Because it's casting a shadow onto itself. So the darker shadow of the interior of the cylinder is on the lighted side. And we can just keep a take our eraser and pull out just a, ooh, a nice pretty little sparkle there and you know maybe I'm going to come back in and just darken it up just a little oh and then that make that little edge pop like that and so now we have our sphere our cone and our cylinder and that's really all we need for dealing with our flower so now I'm going to bring my camera up here towards the flower and you can see how all of these things have informed my flower and I've drawn my flower very structurally you'll notice I don't have any of those organic we're going to get into those kinds of organic shapes but if I'm drawing this in my backyard I'm looking at my trumpet flower I'm going to uh, and when I just want to do a study of it to understand how that goes together this will help keep you from being now when you look at this and now let's look quickly at our picture. All of a sudden, this makes a whole lot more sense that we've looked at that. Because what we can do is we can actually take a piece of, a, a nice clean piece of, of paper here. Uh, this, is, uh, this is just regular tracing paper that I have. And you can begin to see these big shapes. You can begin to see how all of these petals operate in an elliptical shape, okay? And then we have our cone here. Always try to keep track of that center line because of course the flower's reproductive organs are gonna be along that central axis there. Also all of our petals move towards, as you can see as I'm starting to draw those elliptical shapes of those petals. And this really breaks down a subject. Now, you know, we went from that to that, and then this is so much more understandable when I'm thinking about how the light, how the light is going to behave on this object here. So when I think about now, let me take this so we have a nice blank background. When I look at this and my light source is going to be coming from that upper left hand corner, I can begin to think about, well, I know that there will be shadow here. Marilyn, can you raise that up just a little bit, please? Yes, thank you. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And so I know that there's going to be shadow here, right? We're gonna have, we're, there's gonna be a turning shadow here. So we're gonna have that there. A little bit, now because this is raised up, we're gonna have a little bit of reflected light there. We also have a cast shadow happening. This is going to be, so I'm just gonna put that 
cast shadow right on top of that because the petal's casting a shadow down onto there. We're going to have some reflected light coming up because reflected light is just that. Reflected light is the light that is reflecting off of the ground plane or other objects and it's bouncing back onto our object. Now look at that. Now that is simply what we had before when we were looking at when we were looking at our cone here so we can see how that's working out. So these kinds of quick sketches can really help you understand how you know a very very complicated subject you take this complicated subject and you break it down into its most basic forms okay so that covers how we use value okay to define three-dimensional forms okay i'm trying to raise up my camera here a little bit for you there we go and now let's start talking about value um, and hue as they come together. But before I do that, I just want to just really quickly give you a chance to think because I'm going to show you the materials that I've been using as I was drawing. So I have my stump here. I have my, my HB pencil here, so a softer pencil. Okay. And as I said, I would normally doing my own watercolor underdrawings, I would be using a 2H. But for our purposes today, I'm using the softer pencil so you can see the, the differences in the values. And then uh, I don't believe that I mentioned my eraser, so I want to mention those. There are two kinds of erasers I tend to use. I use either the pink eraser or lately I've been partial to the white plastic erasers. It's important that you keep the plastic er the white erasers clean. They will smudge the graphite that's on them sometimes onto your page. So you want to be a little careful about that. But you also want to make sure you test your pink eraser and make sure that the, um, some brands of the pink eraser will actually leave a little bit of pink on your page. And that's really not desirable at all. So you want to make sure on a nice piece of scrap paper that you test that 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 it doesn't do that that it won't do that the the difference between the two is this um this is a much less abrasive eraser the white eraser is and the pink eraser is a little more of an eradicator if you really have something that you want to take off um you want to uh, start with the pink eraser if you're just you know, using it for what's called lifting, as I was with the, you know, lifting with highlights and also just generally sharpening up the edges and things, you can use the white eraser. That's what I would advise in using it. You'll also notice that I cut my erasers. I actually take an X-Acto knife so that I can cut them to get sharp edges. And I use that in, you know, getting into little teeny tiny areas to, to do cleanup and things like that. The white eraser also works really, really well. When we get to the very end, I'll show you about lifting any lines, any graphite lines that you do not want showing on your final, on your, on your final painting. So before I get my, as I get my watercolors out, I'm gonna ask Libby, do we have any questions about, about value and light and shade? Where are we ready to roll into the next? I think we're pretty much ready to roll. Um, and just so you know, you're about, we're about half an hour in. Okay, super. Thank you. Uh -huh. I, I am completely time incompetent, so I'm just going to own that. <laughs> so I'm glad you're there to keep me to keep keep me going. Now, what we're going to do is now. Here's the fun part, the part that everybody's been waiting for. We're going to get we're going to get into watercolors. So let me talk about my palette a little. Um, I, I will mention to you that my, my husband finds my palette atrocious. Um, he's also a painter uh, and, a, and he's a, a sculptor as well. Um, but I keep my palette this way because um, it I have painted, obviously I've painted our painting that we're going to paint today before. And I can tell you that I this helps me remember what, I have been painting and what what colors that I used to paint. However, 
uh, one of the things that's also really, really helpful to do is when you're working out colors is again to take a piece of scrap paper that's exactly the same kind of paper as the paper that you will be painting on okay take that scrap paper and you work out your palette on that paper and take notes about that and we're going to talk about this in more detail in a few minutes but that's always helpful to have some to take some of your watercolor paper and i'm working on today i'm working on 90 pound arches um cold uh i'm sorry uh 90 pound arches paper and it is uh, a hot press i just had to check that but i just wanted to make sure now what does that mean so watercolor paper it can be really overwhelming with its terminology uh i i chose this paper because it's fairly smooth and if you if I zoom down a little bit, you can really see there's no, you know, there's no roughness to it at all. Um, I choose this because for our subject today, the texture, the, the watercolor paper having a texture would not be helpful to me. However, if I were going to paint something that had a very uh, shaggy bark or a rough surface to it, I might consider using a cold press paper, which is a paper that has more texture to it, more hills and valleys or more tooth. That's the other term that is often used. So um, it's really a matter of it's an artist's choice. Um, you want to experiment with it so you can make different kinds of paper, so you can make an informed choice, uh, especially when you're thinking about your subject matter. Because something very, very detailed, it'll be very challenging to do that on a rough surface. And the terms hot press and cold press, think for hot press, think that it has been, because this is literally in the process what happens to the paper it's been ironed it's gone through hot rollers to make it very very smooth and very very flat a cold press it went through cold rollers and so during the paper making process it retains some of that natural bumpy texture going through so uh, so when you think about a hot press just remember it's been ironed basically so there's no wrinkles in it and you'll also notice with watercolor paper you can buy it in individual sheets or you can buy it as you can see mine is this is a pad or a block of watercolor paper and you'll notice that the block is actually has an adhesive all the way around, except for one little spot, okay, right on the top. This is like the top binder, uh, binding of the page. And in here, this is just enough room for you to stick the end of a brush in, and you can, or you can get something, I have a chopstick handy. You can, some brushes actually have a beveled edge and you can stick that in there and you can pull it gently through and then all the way around to release the paper from the block when you're done. Now, why would you want this? Well, you would want that because if the paper is completely secured on all the edges, it's what's called pre-stretched, which means that the paper that will naturally want to buckle, that is create hills and valleys when the water is applied to it, it won't be able to do that because it's going to be bound at all the edges and it won't be able to move. And so your surface will stay very, very nice and flat. That will also help you in keeping, um, it, that, that will also help you keep control over your, um, over, over where the pigment is and because controlling where the pigment is on a watercolor is is absolutely essential so let's let's take a look at this now the brushes that i have here Mary Ellen, okay. i'm sorry to interrupt um i no, have no. a paper question for you before you get off the um yes. uh, is higher weight more smooth or rough um oh. if the paper doesn't mention hot or cold press is it automatic that it's one or the other that's a, that's a great question that okay so watercolor paper if you're if first of all i want to make a make the statement that if you're confused by watercolor paper terminology join the club okay it it takes a while to really really get to understand it so i did neglect to mention that this uh, um I explain at least uh, that this is 90 pound paper. So what that means is that a ream of this paper, that means a um, hundred sheets of it 
cut at 20 by 30, I believe is the dimensions, weighs 90 pounds. I, I know that may seems like, why would that matter? So it has, to, <laughs> what it has to do is with the actual thickness of the paper, which is what the person's question was. So the, the, the way watercolor paper thickness is measured is in quantities of 100 sheets and the weight of those 100 sheets together. So that doesn't tell you a lot about like the individual sheet of paper. So you can have 90 pound hot press, you can have 90 pound cold press. The hot or cold will tell you the tooth of the paper. So the hot press will be a smoother tooth and the cold press will be a rougher tooth. The, um, and uh, the poundage of the paper will, the higher the weight, will tell you the actual thickness of the paper. Now, 90 pound paper, you need to stretch or keep it in a block like this is. As I mentioned, it's adhered on all the sides for, for this. I'm gonna zoom out just a bit so you can maybe see a little more of the block itself. So, so 90 pound needs to be stretched. If you had 200 pound paper, you would not need to stretch that paper because it would be so thick that it would not get the little hills and valleys and buckle. So the advantage of working on thicker paper is that you don't have to bind it down on the edges, but you can get hot press or cold press in thicker paper uh, or thinner paper. So does that answer the question? I think so, yeah. Someone else asked <laughs> what the thinnest paper is that you could get. Yeah. The thinnest, uh, you, I think there's a, I, I never work with anything less than 90 pounds myself. That's my personal preference. Um, and the, uh, the thinnest paper I believe you can get, I think there's a 50 and a 60 pound paper. Um, but that you would need to either, um, tape down on the edges, have it in a block or work with it, um, stapled. And, and work with it very carefully. Um, the thinner the paper, the more you have to uh, watch how much water you're putting on the page at once because you don't want to um, structurally compromise the paper. The other thing that I should mention, especially since we're, um, since we're working um, to, since we're working all visually and not in person here, is, is that it is typical for watercolor paper to have a smell when it, um, when, when it gets wet. So uh, I use, the, this paper is an Arches brand paper. I'm also fond of, um, of uh, Strathmore or a, uh, or a Benfang paper. Uh, those, those papers, the smell that you will smell, um, it's often described as kind of a wet dog smell, or it smells like wet paste. Um, that is actually the, that's the, that's the, um, that's the sizing in the paper, and that's a totally normal smell. So don't be concerned if you smell something strange. Um, that, that, and uh, it's not your imagination either. So what I have here, and I'm going to zoom up a bit just so you can kind of see too the way I'm all set up here. Okay, I have my, I have my brushes here and my, I also have my napkins here. You'll see how I'll be using those in a second. I've got my, my palette. Okay, whoops, my palette went closed on me. There we go. I've got my palette here and I've got my water handy as well. I have three brushes here. Um, they are from a size, um, I have a, an eight, a six, and a four. Um, I'm pretty fond of these. They are all round brushes. For our purposes today, I'm going to be using round brushes, but just so you're aware, and if you look at my fundamentals of watercolor, I discuss this, we do have flats or brights that we can use as well. Um, as I said, for our purposes today, I'm not going to be using a flat brush um, for this because we're, we're pretty detailed today. Um, so I'm going to start out with my, um, with, my, with my number eight here. And we're gonna talk about just basic watercolor techniques. So what you need to do is you wanna, when you buy a brand new brush, you're gonna find that it's gonna have perfect bristles. They're gonna all be starched together. 
and it will look like a perfectly, uh, you know, just like a perfect cone there. Um, you want to always rinse your brush very, very thoroughly and then daub it and then rinse it again really thoroughly to make sure that you don't have any of that sizing left in that brush. And then we're going to be ready to paint. So now I've got my, my watercolor here. You'll notice that I have two blocks on my page. And what I'm going to do with that is I'm going to, I'm going to actually paint a solid wash. I'm going to get some practice here. I'm going to paint my solid wash. And then I'm going to paint a graduated wash. So the solid wash, I'm going to just pick any pigment that I like. I'm going to be working with a color right now called Hooker's Green. Okay, and you'll notice that when I put my brush in to activate, I use tube colors. I keep them in my own palette uh, uh, arrangement. Uh, there's a picture of this again on my website if you're curious about the specifics of my palette arrangement and, uh, and colors. You'll also notice that if, if you can read under the mess of my, of, of my color mixing, <laughs> You can see that I have each pan labeled. Uh, and I, I do this because you think you'll remember, but you won't. Um, and sometimes two blues or two greens right next to each other look very, very similar. When they come out of the tube, they look similar. So it's just really helpful if you take a Sharpie marker and you label uh, what the pan is if you set up your own palette like this. The other thing that's really important to remember, this is a little pro tip that I learned a long time ago and was very, very grateful for. Um, you'll notice that watercolors like to slip out of the pan, and I'll show you an example of that right here. So I have one, one of them, this is dry, but it has slipped out of the pan. And one of the things that um, I realized that I did was I did not, you're gonna, if I, if I tilt it, I'm gonna hold it up to the camera so you can see, I hope, a little bit. You can see where I took some sandpaper and I roughed out the pan of the watercolor. It's a little high. I should have tucked it down in here a little bit more. You sand the pan of the of your palette so that the uh, the when you put the wet uh, when you put the the uh, wet paint in from the tube that it gets down into those little scratches that you make and then it holds on to the palette and it doesn't slip out like that. So that's a just a, a little pro tip that you can do when you're making your own palette is labeling and sanding before you put it in. I also make note often when I label to of the brand. Um, different brands have slight, even though every major brand of watercolor will have French ultramarine, different ones are slightly different. Different brands are slightly different. And if you have a preference for one ultramarine brand versus another, make a note of it. So then when you go back to buy it, you buy that specific French ultramarine. So here I'm going to be using Hooker's Green here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you how to do just a solid wash. And I'm going to, as I, as, as you see, I've loaded the, I've activated the, the color in the pan. So I've got a nice, you know, I've got a nice amount of a, of a very rich value here, you know, probably 50-50 water and pigment right here, okay, if we had to do percentages. And you'll notice I have a tendency to roll the brush in my hand. That's to make sure that I get full coverage in the brush. And then I wipe off the excess on that little edge like that. So now my brush is ready to go. I'm going to start up here. This is a great exercise to teach you some control. And watercolor is a hurry up and wait medium. So you have to hurry up to keep it consistent. And then you're going to have to wait for it to get just the right amount of dryness that you want it to be. So you see, I'm working for consistency here, trying to make sure that those values, that value 
is one solid color all the way from top to bottom here. And I'm also trying to control that by keeping nice tight edges and then working back over the edges, <clears throat> excuse me, over the edges that I created there. I'm gonna go work back up into here and down again. And then we have a nice consistent color. Great exercise to get you warmed up. Mary Ellen, we're getting a little bit of a light reflected off of the- um, Oh, I see that. Yeah. There we go. Thank you. There we go. So a little tilt like that. Now, remember too, that in watercolor, gravity can be your friend. So just as I just tilted my page, you can tilt your page as well. And um, you can get the pigment to run one way or the other in order to get different effects. And we're gonna, we're gonna talk about that right now because right now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do a graduated wash. And in this case, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start with the same color with the green, okay? And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start with very, you're gonna notice very, very dark value here of the, so this is all hooker's green, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a value scale for the hooker's green. And I'm going to do that in watercolor. I do that by increasing the amount of water and reducing the amount of pigment as I go along. So trying to keep those edges, keeping it nice. I do have my, I'm actually holding my watercolor block at a slight, just at a, at a slight angle. Like I said, gravity can be your friend. Now what I'm gonna do is you're gonna notice I am blotting my brush for the first time. I'm getting any excess pigment out of my brush. So now I'm actually, I actually have a clean brush here. And I'm just gonna take that all the way down. So we have a value scale for the green now, from our darkest green to a li the lightest green, but this is all the same hue, all the same color. Okay, now you actually can make this darker yet. And let's talk about that. Okay, this is where we need to understand how hue and value can work to can really work together. So what I'm going to do is right below this, I'm going to create a, another little block. And I'll just I'll do that right here. I, I like to no fuss, no muss, use the edge of my pencil here, make a block. See, this is such a great, you know, and some days when you feel like doing, you know, you feel like making, you feel like having the pencils, the, the watercolor out, but you just say, like, don't know what to paint. I don't know what to do. I, that, don't worry about it. That, do a couple exercises. Do, do something like this. And then, you know, just to sort of keep your skill set going and, and it's, it's just so much fun to do it that way. And then you don't have to worry about uh, about about you know what the subject is until until whatever you want to paint shows itself so you can just you know do this and practice now here we get into a little color theory okay so we're using green now on the color wheel and again you can look at my workshop reference pages and you can find a color wheel um, right now you just have to take my word for it <laughs> <laughs> the the opposite of green okay and and is is going is red okay so right opposing color to it is red now you'll notice that we very very often um have contrasting colors as symbolic colors so you know red and green are often associated with christmas um you know we have 
uh, purple and yellow are associated a lot of times with Easter eggs and things like that. So if you look around and also high contrast signs um, are, are often that way, especially construction signs, things like that, where you have the lettering is in a very, very like midnight blue against a bright, bright orange. And that catches our eye. So these contrasting colors are things that we really, really, um, you know, catch the human eye. Now, one of the things that we do is there uh, is you uh, never okay and and this there's there's very few things that are that I say never about but never add black to make a color darker we can make the screen darker but if we add black to it it will kill the color you will notice there is no black on my palette okay this is and just in case you were looking at that that's actually a very this is a, this is actually a dark blue it's called Payne's gray it's a it's a beautiful color um it's actually one of my favorite colors and we're going to talk about Payne's gray a little bit later but it's a it's what Payne's gray is it's actually french ultramarine mixed with a burnt umber and if and and uh and that makes a beautiful blue blue gray color now you can darken things using that, but using those using that much color, that many that many pigments in one mix, you run the risk. Or using black, you run the risk of killing the color. And by killing it, I mean that it makes it lifeless. Um, black also tends to flatten things out, and in watercolor, we want to have as many layers of transparency as we can because that's what gives that sparkle and that life to watercolor it's the light passing through those layers of pigment bouncing off of that white ground and coming back to your eye that gives watercolor life so what we want to do here is um we're going to start in the middle okay it's going to seem very strange but we're going to start in the middle here with the pure hue Okay, so we're gonna start in the middle of our, this is the middle of my, you can see here's the top and here's the bottom. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm going to- Yeah, and we're getting a little bit of that reflection on the page again, just so you know. Oh, okay. All right, let me, let me adjust a little bit here. Let me see if we can calm down a little and if I can move over a hair. Is that better? A little less reflection now. Yeah, I think so. We'll see. Uh, yeah, it's still getting a little bit of light reflected on it, but let's see. Let's see how it goes. There you go. Okay. Perfect. All right. So there we go. So now what I'm going to do? Oh boy! Now I really do have to hurry up and wait. <laughs> Let me move this over here. So now what we're going to do is, I'm going to do exactly what I did above. I've got my value scale, and what I'm doing is essentially by thinning out the pigment, okay, on the bottom half here of this scale, by thinning this out, I'm essentially adding white. I'm actually adding the white of the paper, okay? So this is how we get tints and values of the same color, okay? So here's our pure hue. And now what I'm gonna do, as I said, gravity can be our friend. I'm gonna flip my, I'm gonna flip it because now what we're going to do is we're going to go to and i'm going to tilt it up again so you don't get that nasty reflection okay and i'm going to add a little more here try to get rid of that line one of the things to be aware of is certain pigments are more forgiving than others when it comes to drying with an edge it can be to your advantage. Sometimes that edge, as you see when we get painting, will be abs can be absolutely beautiful, particularly for um, for flower petals and things like that. And then other times it can be an unfortunate line. Um, so most of the time, um, through practice, you'll learn which pigments are more staining than others and which ones can be more manipulated than others. Now what I'm going to do, you're going to see I have that pure hue and I'm grabbing my palette here. And for those of you who didn't see that, let me show you. You can see with my palette, if you were wondering what that hole was in my palette, that's, that's for my thumb. 
So my thumb sticks through there. And so I can hold my palette. It's very, very handy to have it like that. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna set this up just a bit. I wanna set this so you can see it. Oh, apologies. A little, little technical thing there. Okay. There we go. And now what we're going to do is I'm actually going to start to add red because remember I told you red is the opposite of green. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to add just a bit into, into that mix. I'm going to keep, I'm going to add some green and you're going to start to notice the color shifting. Now you'd never want to add enough of the opposite color that you can look at it and say, oh, there's red in that. What you should add is enough of the color that you see it darkening. And then as you go progressively down, you're gonna see that value is getting much darker than the previous value was. I'm gonna add just a little more and I'm actually going to do it right here on my palette, add the same green to it because I don't want to run the risk of having, oh, look at that. That's such a nice, rich color. And you can see how we're going from the pure hue all the way to an almost, what would almost be described as a, as a green black, but this is by adding the opposite color. That's really kind of amazing. Mary Ellen, while you're finishing that up, we've had a couple of questions. Great. Um, All right. The first one, really quickly, what red were you just using? Oh, great question. That was a vermilion. That was a vermilion red that I was using Thank for that. You. I find that hookers green and vermilion red like each other. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and actually, I, I say that and without meaning to be sort of silly. Um, but the reason why I say that is because um, certain pigments don't like to mix. And that's why I really, really recommend that you that, you know, you you, you experiment on scrap paper for your colors beforehand. Um, and then uh, is it best to use tubes of paint rather than dry paints? And then we had another question about liquid watercolors as well. Oh, you know, that is that, you know, that's going to be up to you. Um, it, it really is. I, I don't. And it, it's really whatever works best for you. Uh, a lot of people um, and it's not a quality issue either. A lot of people prefer um, dry pan watercolors. There are great uh professional quality dry pan watercolors. Um, it's completely up to what you prefer. I was taught with, to be perfectly honest, I was taught watercolor using tube paints. And that's why I, that's why I've continued to use them. There's not really, it's just what I'm used to. Um, and someone uh, is struggling a little bit with their liquid um, watercolors to get the value scale um, correct. So the main thing that I would recommend is, is if you're using the uh, liquid watercolors, it is really helpful if you have a, um, if you have a palette where um, you can mix, pre-mix different values of it. And, you know, um, this is a great question. And one second. I don't normally do this, but I'm going to run across my studio for one second, Libby. And I'm going to grab the kind of palette that I'm talking about so people can see this. If you're using liquid watercolors, I would recommend that you get a porcelain palette like this. Some people call it a flower palette for, you know, obvious reasons. And what's really nice is if you have liquid, liquid watercolors, and, and even if you don't, even if you find that, you know, you can put your pure pigment in here. Okay, so I'm mixing in you know, there's so there's a, a daub of my pure pigment. Then what I can do is I can take that and then I can mix up a variety of different values. So I'll mix up this one to be much, much lighter. And then I can have those readily available for me when I'm painting rather than um, rather than 
um, having to fuss with it, you know, while things are wet and you're sort of running to get the right blend and so on and so forth. So um, this is something I really, really recommend. You also can just get little jam jars and mix it up in little jam jars too, but these aren't too expensive and you can find these on any, um, on any art website. So I, I hope that helps. Oh, definitely, yeah. Um, and then, there's, oh, what, um, what about watercolor pencils? Oh, watercolor pencils. Well, that's a whole different animal. Um, for <laughs> so I uh, so there are there are so many uh, new media now. Uh, so watercolor pencils and also uh, water soluble graphite, which has been one of my latest crazes. I just super enjoy water soluble graphite. Um, runs the same same fund fundamental. But it's the same thing. Um, the basically what I would say with watercolor pencils, the main thing, and I, I actually don't have any, I'm, I'm looking very quickly to see if I have any like right. It's the advantage of being in my studio. I actually have none like right at hand where I could show folks, but basically with watercolor pencils, you want to make a very, very light application. Um, maybe what I can do is I can show because it's the same principle with the graphite. I have, okay, so very quickly, because this is a, a little bit off of our subject, but I do want to answer the question. So this is a water-soluble graphite pencil. It works exactly the same way as uh, colored pencils do. So those of uh, the water-soluble colored pencils, those of you who are uh, who love colored pencil, um, you would actually do it the same, you would work with your colored pencils exactly the same way, except what you want to do is make sure that you keep the value and you're mixing. So if you wanted a certain color, you would, you would put it down as you normally do. And then if you had a contrasting color to enrich that color, you would bring it on. You know, I like to work, when I work with colored pencils, I like to work with them at opposing angles so that you get a kind of pointillism going on and a sort of microscopic scale because it, one color's pigment is laid at one angle and the other color's pigment is laid at the other angle. Um, for those of you uh, who recall the work of Georges Seurat, um, who, uh, did the he was an impressionist pointillist painter that was it's it's kind of the same principle the way that he laid down the dots on the canvas he was using oil paint but you see you get but keep it very very light make sure when you're using either the water soluble graphite or um the colored pencil and then what i like to do with it is i like to do what's called what i call backwashing i backwash i go from the lightest into the darkest area and then that way i have the pigment kind of under control because if you go this way you know you work from the richest area or the darkest area you run the risk of sort of muting the whole thing if you go back into it i keep the light area light the dark area dark and i work back into it that way so whether you're using water soluble graphite or you're using colored pencil, uh, water soluble colored pencil, the principle would be the same. So does that does that answer the question? Yep, I think so. Thank you. Um, we're a little yes. we're a little over an hour in. Also, just so you know, it's perfect because it's time to actually paint our painting now. It's so great. <laughs> so and I have I am so impressed with the questions. We have some really like serious, um, we, we have some really like folks that are really thinking about media and, and technique. And so that's, that's really exciting to get those kinds of questions. So thank you. Um, okay. So I'm getting set up here. We've got, you'll notice we have our underdrawing. Now I will mention to you my, un, my underdrawing. Okay. Again, I did do it in, um, you notice it's very light. But even so, um, I did do this in a HB pencil, so you all would see it. If it was in a 2H pencil, 
you just wouldn't see it. It, it just would not show up on the camera. But, um, and you probably are wondering, well, why would you, what, what's the difference? Why not have it darker so I can see it more easily? That's a great question. The reason why you don't want to have it too dark is because when there is less binder in the pencil, um, it me, which is what happens when you have softer pencils, that is the darker lead. When you have those, the problem with that is, is that the graphite is very loose and it wants to move around on the page. And it really can um, run the risk of kind of killing some of your colors. Because again, what happens is, is then you're mixing black, right, into your pigment. Um, and it's a very, very reflective black too. So you want to be a little bit cautious about, about that um, and using that. Now, I did mention to you, and um, before we get started with this, I did mention to you there is a technique um, that is was very, very popular in the, um, and I wanna show this to you briefly as we get started, um, that was very, very popular in the, probably the 1700s towards the, uh, into the mid 1800s, uh, particularly during the age of exploration. Um, as a matter of fact, um, John Good and uh, his wife, Elizabeth, the, the famous ornithologists, they um, were both very fond of this technique. Uh, it's a technique that lends itself to um, engraving and lithography. And what it is, is it's actually using, you'll notice I have a, this is a 2H pencil and I'm being a little heavy handed with it. Um, but you're actually putting in the values. So you're doing a complete value drawing in in graphite very very lightly and then you will use the transparency of the watercolor to paint over it it is so for those of you who are real aficionados of of botanical illustration um nine times out of ten if you see a work um, that's done during, as I said, during that age of exploration, you know, the exotic plants when the Kew Gardens were, were, you know, sending out young, brave botanists to go find incredible plants. And they started their seed collection and things like that. Nine times out of 10, those drawings that you see, they started as graphite sketches with watercolor overlay, which is what I'm, I'm doing here. I'm doing the underdrawing for that. Now, this is one technique that you can use, and I'll show it to you briefly in this. So if I call this drawing done, which I wouldn't, but for our purposes today, I will, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll for for my purpose for our purposes today, I will take the little the little perfectionist artist that is jumping up and down and squealing in my head right now. I will <laughs> I will silence her, and and we'll just go ahead with this sketch, and um, and so because I've done all the values in in this two H pencil, it's it's a pretty stable drawing. It's not gonna go anywhere. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to start out with my, um, this is a, this is a cad red. This is a cad red light, um, which is basically the color of our, of our, um, trumpet flower. But I just want you to get in a sense of how you can paint over this. And you will notice that the values will, we're going to need to add a little bit of green in there because there's a beautiful transition that goes on. And I'm going to let that go. Because sometimes the watercolor just does the work for you. So this is our hooker's green down into the stem and I'm again this is not a very naturalistic drawing this is just our 
our little study drawing, but it really helps wrap, helps you, helps me wrap my mind around what I'm doing. If I paint a little study like this, when I'm feeling a little overwhelmed by a subject. And you can see how that pencil sketch is, is showing through. And it gives, it gives some really lovely dimension to it. And again, but nothing, nothing stronger than, or, or uh, nothing softer than a 2H pencil for this. And you'll see how that, you know, we just let the, we're just letting the watercolor do the work. And letting that reveal itself, that pencil drawing reveal itself through those transparent layers. Really fun technique to experiment with. Again, it's kind of a classic um, botanical illustration technique that a lot of folks use. Again, back in back in the day. I, I've been reading a book that if you are into um, botanical illustration and the history of it, you'll notice right now what I'm doing is I'm lifting, I'm making, taking some of the pigment away with a clean brush. There we go. And I'm making that lighter on there. I need to add a little turning shadow here. Didn't quite get that quite dark. But the book that I'm reading is called The Flower Hunters. And it's basically the history of botanical exploration. Really fascinating stuff. If, if that is something that interests you, I, I highly recommend it. And you can see how in this technique, one of the things that's very nice about it is, is that if you're feeling a little unconfident about how to get that blending of from, from you know, a very, very light value of a hue to a darker value of a hue, you can use the water, you can, you can use the underdrawing as your guide in doing that if you create the underdrawing with the 2H pencil. So that's one technique that you can use in, um, in, in your approach with this, okay? Another technique that you can use if you're, if you're getting, if you're new to this, we're gonna use a little bit of a combination of this technique that I'm about to show you and just to kind of, and then just mixing our values freely as we begin to paint. Another technique that works very, very well. And uh, what I will do is I will actually paint that um, on top of this one is by mixing a shadow blend, okay? I learned this from a wonderful book um, that is written by a fellow who has now passed away named Keith West, um, a, a terrific book um, for uh, uh, getting started. It's called How to Paint Wi Wildflowers. I believe it is still in print. And so, and he was the one who taught me to mix French ultramarine and uh, burnt sienna. I wish I had had the advantage of actually having met him, but his book was has been a real inspiration to me. So you're gonna notice what I'm mixing is a is a very very blue gray color okay you can also use Payne's gray if you have that tube color but the advantage of this is and and again this is when you want to think about color theory your color theory about you're mixing a very very warm color with a very very cool color that will give you a neutral Okay, and um, and so you you have this neutral color that has aspects of warm and cool in it. Therefore, it's not competing. So what I use that for okay, is Ellen, which colors did you use there that you blended? I was uh, French ultramarine and burnt sienna. Thank you. Yeah, you can also use a burnt umber. It will give you a little bit of a cooler color. But I like the sienna because it has a lot of red in it. And what you can do is you can actually take, create an underpainting, okay? 
and you will just create a monochrome of your subject completely in gray in in this 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 just absolutely lovely blue gray and you know some of the areas that you want white now remember in watercolor white is white don't touch it leave it alone i know it's hard but you have to just leave it be if you want to highlight there and then you can see how now if i leave this dry I can come over this and again this is where you have to keep a little bit of control because if I paint over this I don't want to overwork the the underpainting I'm just I will let this dry very very thoroughly I, I'm to tell you the truth the times that I use this technique I let the underpainting dry for a day before I go back into it and paint my colors over top. And so you can see, you could get an entire monochrome of the painting. And it's actually quite lovely. And, and you can really adjust all of your values. In the painting there. And then you can come back another day and paint over this the, the with what I like to call the local color, the color that the flower actually is. And these will show through. It's really quite remarkable technique. Um, if you do look at the Keith West book, and it is spelled West, like North, North, South, East, West. Um, if, if you if you do look that up and it's how to paint watercolors, he talks about this technique and he actually shows you step by step instructions with it, um, step by step photographs with it. And if you look on my website, I actually have the same the same kind of thing. It was inspired by Mr. West. Absolutely phenomenal, uh, ph phenomenal botanical artist. So now that we've looked at our sort of 17th century technique, our this is this is actually more of a 19th century technique using this underpainting technique like this. Now we're just going to go to jump dive into the 21st century here. We have our subject. One of the things that I do want to mention about the about my painting, not only is my painting, uh, my underdrawing done in a darker uh, pencil. Uh, but it's also a little bit larger. And again, that's that's for your benefit so that everybody can kind of see my painting. But let's talk about let's let's talk about our little our little pollinator friend here. So this is what we're shooting for, right? We want to we want to accomplish this today. And so let's talk about how we're going to get there. Um, we have our reference picture handy. Uh, I often have multiple reference pictures that I use um, mainly for uh, color and form and, and on because you get that kind of variation of color. I often have live uh, flowers that I, that I paint from as well. Now, what we want to think about is we, we're going to, in, in, um, in preparing our underdrawing, and again, if you look on my website, I have a short video for how to prepare an underdrawing. You know, you have your, you, you have the drawing itself. And if you want to transfer it very quickly onto watercolor paper, one of the things that I do, you'll see that I have my original template here. And all I've done is taken a pencil. And remember, this is the grade school trick, right? And you just make transfer paper for yourself. I've just, on the back of the page, I have just very evenly scribbled. And this I did use a B pencil for because I'm using it as a transfer. Scribbled that. And then I simply put it on the page and I trace over my drawing. And when I lift it up, I go over it very, very lightly with the 2H pencil, just really lightly to make sure that I've got it. And I lift off anything that looks smudgy or um, extraneous with my white eraser. And I've got my nice, clean drawing 
ready to go. Now let's talk about our little friend here because flower anatomy is one thing, but most of us freeze up a little bit when we start thinking about animal anatomy. So the hummingbird is a truly amazing uh, animal and at 400 wing beats per minute, I just, what, a, what an amazing statistic that is about it. When, just as we did with flowers, don't be intimidated by animals. You can look at them just as you do the flowers and break them down into big shapes, big basic shapes. Now, I, I, I hope some of you, when I did that, when I just put that overlay of basic shapes on there was just a huge sigh of relief all of a sudden, like, oh, okay. I had, I, 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 I know the first time that I was studying animal anatomy. Uh, and again, that's something that you can do that many, many artists do. It's a wonderful pursuit, but you don't have to make a professional study of animal anatomy to create an enjoyable, delightful, realistic, depiction of an animal. Um, it helps to understand a few things about them. So, you know, that they have this, this rib cage, which is essentially creates a kind of egg shape, that rib cage, distinctive with the, um, and this is where animal anatomy gets really fun when you get into the sort of distinctive aspects of each animal. They're breastbone is actually, or sternum is actually has a, a, a large extension that goes forward. And this is a, it is more like a big flat plate. And this is what all the wing muscles attach to. So this is what enables them to fly. One of the other things that's really fascinating about animal anatomy is that you'll find that the vast majority of vertebrates have all the same bones. They're just in slightly different proportions and slightly different arrangements. So we have our little friend's shoulder is here, their elbow, their wrist, and the phalanges that make up our fingers are actually right at the very, very end here. Now this is a shorter arrangement on the, on the uh, hummingbird than it is on most birds. Most birds, this is a, a more elongated, but this is part of the uniqueness which makes their flight ability uh, possible. Basic parts of the bird here, so that we want that that we want to think about when we look at that, and then again, just keeping in mind that we can reduce this bird down to an almost like a cartoon character and do a value. We're not gonna do that here today because of uh, our time together so short, but you could do a value study of the bird in different positions, just as a simple cartoon character to understand how light, shade and shadow are acting on those forms. So I encourage you to do that because then once you sort of have the forms in your mind, that's when you can begin the delightful aspect of capturing all these beautiful details of, of feathers and coloration and things like that. So let's get painting. As I said, this is gonna be our goal, okay? And I have, I keep my, my little photograph here, my little, little, it's just a little color printout. I keep that here as a reference. And I also have a, um, just so you know, we were talking about setup earlier. I actually have a bulletin board right in front of my, of, of my, uh, there we go. I wanna make sure we're all angled up here. Let me make sure we get all squared up because we're going to be doing an extensive painting. So if you don't have water or your paper towel or napkins at the ready, now would be a great time to do that while I'm getting us all sort of squared away here. And um, so what I do I have, only have about a half an hour left in class, just so you know. That's Perfect. Thank you. And so um, what I do have is I have a bulletin board actually in front of my uh, the table that I paint at. And that way I can have all of my reference pictures and reference drawings and study drawings up in front of me. So I can all I need to do is look up if I want to see something. So now I mentioned this to you before. 
this is my palette that I've determined and I'm going to go ahead and, and uh, I'm going to start with my, my number eight brush here. Okay. I'm very comfortable with this brush. Uh, it has a very fine tip on it. So that helps me get the detail that I'll need. And so what I begin is I look at my palette, I look at my, and I look at my reference picture and I try to, and I play the color match game and I try to match my colors. So as soon as I look at that, that sort of corner of the, I've, I've got my flowers there. We talked about this being, um, being cadmium red. Okay. So we have a nice cad red light. Okay. Also, I've noticed that it does have some yellow there. It's a very vivid yellow. Uh, I'm going to be using a cadmium yellow as well. You notice that cadmium, which is a lead-based uh, pigment, you do want to be careful. It's not highly poisonous, but you do want to be careful not to get it under your nails or to wash it out if it is under your nails. It's not good for you. Um, but consider the source. Um, this is the person who's been washing her watercolor brush and her tea for years. That's why my tea stays on the left now and my watercolor wash water stays on the right. <laughs> I don't know. Perhaps it's an explanation for my own eccentricities. I don't know. Um, so then we have our cad yellow. Here's our hooker's green. We, we're going to need to, for our leaves, we're going to need to have a a lighter version of that. So of course we can add water to it, but we can brighten it up and add transparency. We're gonna use the same yellow. Um, and this brings up the subject that when you, are when you are creating the palette for your painting, try to do it. It's a little like poetry. Poetry tries to say beautiful things in as few words as possible. Try to keep that sort of poet's state of mind. You want to try to make your statement in as few colors as possible. Here's my French ultramarine, beautiful color. Kind of, it has a little bit of um, alizarin crimson in it. You can't really see it, but so there's a touch of purple to it, which is one of the reasons why it works so well. So our French ultramarine, now, the reason why I chose French Ultramarine is when we add it to the, to the, the um, CAD light, we get a nice darker value, <clears throat> excuse me, with the CAD light. We can also add it to the hooker's green. And when we do that, we get a nice, blue, deep blue green value that works well too. So I've got my palette set and let's get started. So any questions Libby before I get onto the canvas here? I'm gonna say given our time, I would say go ahead and jump in and I'll get some questions for you at the end. Okay, sounds good. So now the big question is going to be always, where do I start, okay? I always say start where you're most comfortable. Also, too, if you are not comfortable with um, with keeping your hand off of your off of your page, you can have a piece of scrap paper around, and you can just lay it down if you need to lay your wrist down. Okay, uh, but in the future, try to try to if you if you've any of you have played the piano, you know, wrists up, wrists up. So you want to try to keep those wrists up uh, if you can. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead. Oh, I noticed I got some water here. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to get started on something that I feel very confident about. I feel after all of the preparation that we've done that I can kind of handle doing the um doing the, uh, so, uh, I'm sorry, the cone shape of the flowers here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take that. I know that I'm going to need to make it go. There's going to be some value on this, but I'm going to start with a very, I'm going to start with a very um, deep cadmium red light. 
Notice I'm doing a graduated wash with it. There is a, I'm going to keep this going and I want to fade it all the way out to the end. When we get to the edges, generally when you get to the edges of your drawing, you always want to fade your hues so that the painting resolves itself nicely. I'm going to back paint that just a little. I want that to be quite light in there. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to come in a little bit with my, with a little bit of the French ultramarine in here. While it's still a bit wet, you'll notice it's dried just a hair. I'm going to bring a little more of the cad light in. And I'm getting that shadow. Isn't that lovely? And I'm going to let that, you know, sometimes I'm just going to, I'm going to let the paint do the work. If it, if it's maybe not exactly where I thought it should be, that's okay. I, you know, it, it will actually end up looking more natural if you let it kind of do its own thing. So I'm going to let that do its own thing a little bit there. I love, you know, especially with botanical subjects, it's really nice when it gets that sort of, that sort of natural bleed. This is a, this is called bleeding in here or blooming. I actually prefer blooming. Bleeding makes it sound like it's a bad thing. <laughs> now, one of the things that I try to do too, is I try to do kind of like to like. So, um, I'm getting a little bit of a darker value in here. I am avoiding that little beak like the plague. I do not want to get any color on that beak. I'm going to paint around it very carefully, keeping it really wet. And then I'm going to again, I'm going to paint out from the darker value there. I might have to come in and make a little dark. Mm, I might have overdone there. I'm not too happy with that. I'm going to bring in a little more cad light while it's still really, really wet. Might be able to lit, lift out a little bit of that darker value. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring some yellow in because I've got yellow up on these edges here in a few spots. I'm going to come in with that cadmium yellow. I'm working a little fast here, but I kind of need to. And I'm going to come in with the cad red and I'm going to let that bloom, let that yellow bloom into that orange. This is a little wet. I'm going to pull some of that color out. So let me, what I did was I, I just, I just blotted my brush just a little to make it a little dry. And I'm coming back in and pulling out that highlight. Very wet right now. Just want to get that general movement from the edge of that flower petal down into the center of the flower. Going to do the same thing on the other side here. The edge of my, my yellow has dried a bit. So I'm going to have to clean my brush, blot it, and then come back in get that a little wet so it blooms into the cad red light and you can see we're starting to get you can see why we spent all the time now on talking about value and hue because that's how we get that that's how we get that to move that we get that visual movement going on Okay, next we're going to come right in. We're going to do the other petal here. Now, one of the things that I noticed about this petal in particular, very, very bright up here on the edge. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to add in here where the petal seems to have folded on itself a bit. I'm going to put the thicker amount of pigment. And then I'm going to come in with a wet brush, not too wet, just wet enough but you're going to notice how I'm going to start to get that value and I'm going to create a graduated wash as I move up. See, I'm avoiding the beak still. 
and I'm just creating that graduated wash. This is going to be very light when it gets here. Very, very light. Right around that beak like that. There we go. And now we have like the little fold in the petal. I've captured that right in there just like that. Now, this petal I'm going to leave alone for right now. And the reason being is because that petal, you can see it has wet on this side and wet on that side. And I don't want to take the chance that this isn't quite dry or that dark shadow isn't quite dry and it's going to mess. It's going to, I'm going to have this petal blooming into the back of the flower and I'm going to lose my three dimensional effect. So I'm going to leave it alone for now and I'm going to come down here and I'm going to begin exactly the same way that I did before. Okay. With our second flower starting with that heavy cad red light okay and again it can be really complicated and uh, overwhelming at first if you're if you're just like oh my goodness how much is heavy how much is light a lot of this comes simply from practice and you'll get a feel for your brush and for the pigment so please do not be frustrated we're not born knowing and you you just need to you need to kind of just keep practicing and go with the flow with it but if at any point it seems sloppy and it feels out of control you need to edge back you need to keep that brush a little a little less loaded with pigment and and water and just put it on in lighter layers then. Now you see how I did exactly the same approach. I went in again with that mixture of cad red light and the French ultramarine. And we're getting that really nice, we're getting that, 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 that really nice blooming from the darker value down into the the tube of the flower there. Again, leaving this petal alone, okay, for now, I'm gonna leave that one alone, and then going up to our petal up here that has a little bit of, little bit of yellow on the edge there. I think it's a little too heavy. Here's a great example. I'm taking a dry brush and lifting out some of that yellow. That's what you do. And I'm going to start again down here, a little more pigment, starting with that graduated wash again, watching out for the little bird wing, because that's going to be a completely different color. Let that bloom into there and very, very carefully. And again, you know, I just had that feeling. I was like, oh, there's a lot of pigment. There's a lot of fluid here. I just blotted my brush and I used it as a sponge and pulled out some of that pigment until it felt like it was a little more back in control again. Adding a little bit of that French ultramarine in there. Now you notice I'm going to skip this petal. I'm going to give this a chance to dry. And I'm going to go right down here. And again, another graduated wash. I'm going to keep it dark because this part of the petal turns down. So I'm going to keep this a little bit darker in here, a little, little more pigment on there. And I'm going to lighten this up a lot right there because it's catching the light. Okay, let's go back up to here, finish this one off. This is a time when we do our turning shadow. So I'm putting the heavy pigment kind of in the middle of that petal. And what I'm doing is I'm graduating it out to up here where it meets where it moves towards the center of the flower 
and I'm bringing it down here where I am going to add a little bit of a shadow in here because it is turning down. Bring that up there. Getting a lot of movement now, which is really nice. And then what I'll do is I'll actually pull out a little reflected light here. And you see that little bit of contrast creates the difference so we can see this petal distinguished from the background there. I'm going to bring that edge out to it. Okay. We also have another petal right here, very light, very much in the light. So we're going to keep it light. Bring that out to there. Mary Ellen, as you're painting, just so you know, we have about 15 minutes left. Okay, great. Well, we will be on to our bird shortly. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to lighten this up a whole lot more. It's in the background. Oh, my bad. I lost track of where that petal was coming from. Sorry, I have to reverse that where I was making it light, I actually need to make it a little darker because this is turning down. There we go. And now we have some distinction between the two petals there. And I'll soften up that edge. Notice how I move from using the tip of my brush to the, to the flat edge of my brush. Um, really, really helpful. Uh, here, we're going to start with a slightly darker in here. Now I'm going to get a little more of the pure cad red and we're going to bring that flower out to there. Now you're probably getting worried about our little friend, but don't because our little friend is, is green, our little winged friend here. He is green and a very, a very, very light blue gray and some dark blue gray. And we're going to, we're going to start taking care of him right now. I'm going to let that dry that one petal there. I'm going to leave that alone for right now. And we're going to go here. And now remember that technique that I told you about that was about painting with the shadow mix only. Well, this is where this is going to come in real handy. So I'm going to mix up a good bit of that shadow mix for myself because we're going to jump right into our little friend. And remember, this is burnt sienna and some French ultramarine. And remember, when we do that, we get this lovely sort of neutral, rich, it's almost like a navy blue, but you'll, it, it's not really, when you see it on your palette, you'll be like, that's not quite navy blue. And, oh, bad me. I just made a few dots on there. I'm gonna daub those up real quick. Okay, now what we're gonna do is, now we're gonna put the shadows in on our bird because he is not, even though his tummy is white, he has a shadow on that. And we're going to put that in. Remember, I'm going to put in the turning shadow first. And then I'm going to lighten that up because we want to get, there's some, some kind of crumbs on my paper. I'm going to try to pick those up a little bit because little crumbs can be a problem because they can be magnets for the pigment and you can get dots where you don't want them. So I just, I just picked them up. I'm glad they came up. And then what I'm going to do is I want to soften. I want this to be a little more distinctive, a little more of a turning shadow here. And then I want to soften this edge out, just really almost fade it out completely. There we go. Okay, so we have that. There's going to be a little bit of a darkness here because this is where the wing is meeting with the body. This is where your photo references can be. Oops, that was way too heavy. 
but we don't panic because your brush acts both as a sponge and as an applicator so you can remove with it as well which is great i'm going to leave that okay and now i'm going to go ahead and on the rest of the body i'm going to put the value you could see now our bird is starting to look a little bit dimensional here and some places i'm going to go quite dark because there are actually feathers that are like a blue black and i'm going to go ahead and put some of those feathers in and in this case we want to leave the brush strokes because the brush strokes those those beautiful edges that we get from the brush strokes are going to give us that beautiful feather pattern so sometimes and this is where i get back to that kind of strange phrase i said before where watercolor is a, a hurry up and wait medium sometimes you have to wait for it to be just the right dryness and then you can go back into it i'm going to darken down this area here in these areas where the wing meets the body and now here comes a little bit where we're very dry up here i'm going to check it with the side of my hand to make sure i don't think anything is going to bleed into there but i'm going to let it go a little longer just because i prefer to be cautious and now in here i'm going to give a few little darker strokes to give some indication of the layering of the wings but i'm not going to fuss over it too much again think think poem okay you want to say it in as few colors and as few brush strokes as you can don't don't get fussy now what i'm going to do this is the part that that can make a person very nervous and i i get that but what you want to do is you want to start down start start up here nice and light and i check the value that was a little dark. Lighten that up. And now I'm going to start to put in, maybe a little darker here. I'm going to start to put in those, those feathers. And I'm going to follow the line work that I put down for the feathers. Notice how I use the brush. I, my wrist is not on the paper. And I'm starting with the tip of the brush and then ever so gently increasing the pressure. And so I start with the tip and then I just gently, as I move it down, simultaneously increasing the pressure. And maybe even, you know, to see how I'm giving a little flourish at the end there. And leave, leave those little whites. That's, that's fine. That's perfectly fine. Now, once again, looks like I have a little tip of a bristle. This happens, but I want to get it out of the way. There we go. Just lifted that up real quick. Now let that dry. Feels pretty dry because it was a really light thing. And now in order to get, you're going to notice on your reference picture, this layering that's going on with you see how there's another set of little wing, little feathers? We're going to get that. We're going to capture that. So now we're going to make this value just a little bit darker, a little more of our burnt sienna. And our, and our ultramarine. And now we're going to go ahead and start up here put that in oh that's a little too blue i'm not liking that i want it to be a little little grayer so i can just adjust it there we go much happier with that and now i'm putting that other layer of feathers that's on the wing okay and i'm following my reference photo for that have to come back make that a little bit darker in there and there we go we have our, our little friend here. Now, while I have this darker color out, I notice that there's some little bit, little bit of feathers here. 
I'm not too happy with that. Let me, since I'm not real happy with that, I might just take my paper and blot it out just a little. Ah, there we go. A little happier there. There we go. I just want to, there's a few sort of, like almost some fuzziness here, a little, little stray feathers here. I want to capture that. And now, last but not least, and we have this nice dark value mixed up here and our flower is really, really dry. Okay. What we're going to do is, and I'm going to very carefully do this. I'm going to turn my, turn my painting to a place where I'm comfortable with it. I'm going to get the camera. So you're going to see it's actually upside down, but the reason I'm doing that is because that's where I'm comfortable with it. I'm going to put my scrap paper down and I've got my brush loaded with a nice, dark value here and what I want to do is the tip of my brush and just like I did with the wings widen out as I get to the head I'm going to let that dry just for a sec I might even go back in and put just a touch more on on the end here so this is a little darker and I'm coming in, this is a little darker on the top. And there's the top of the beak right there, just like that. Mary Ellen, we have five minutes left in class. All right, so let's do green. So now we're going to let that go and we're going to leave the eye go. I know, I know it's killing everyone. You, you want to put the eye in, but we're going to, we're going to save the best for last. I'm going to, because my beak is dry, I'm just going to bring that down just a little bit there. So you didn't have a white there. And now let's put our greens on. It's all hookers green. Okay. Really, really fast stuff to put the green on. So what we're going to do is we're going to go directly to the hookers green. Okay. And now that we know that we have this is all dry in here, this is again where that technique with using your brush is really, really helpful. Have your brush fully loaded, okay, with a nice distinctive, distinctive, you know, um, pigment on there. Bring it right to the tip. We have it. It has toothed leaves. And so what I'm doing is I'm coming in and did you see how I did that? Did you see that I started with it being very dark at the tip? I've got a shadow here, so I'm going to keep that dark. And then I lightened it up with a little bit of water as it came up. And I'm now the advantage of painting leaves like this is you, and I'm, I'm gonna interrupt myself because I'm gonna add just a little of that French ultramarine. See how that went real dark there? That's, and I'm gonna wash that off. And now I'm, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna bring a clean brush into that, just like that. And now we have that movement. And then if you want to capture with that kind of brush strokes that you put that in, you give, you imply the venation in the leaves. And so you don't have to go fussy, fussy, fussy with lots of little tiny lines trying to get it just right. Now I'm going to add a little bit of the hooker's green to the hooker's green. I'm going to add a little bit of the cad yellow because this is the color, it's a little different, a little fresher green color. It's a little too much, so I'm going to add a little more Hooker's Green there. There we go. A little fresher color right there at the end of the flower. And you can see, again, these are singular brush strokes. Just, uh, just singular brush strokes. I'm going to bring that color in up here because I like it. And I love, like I said, I love it when my painting can have a nice unified look to it where 
All of the colors seem related to one another. Always is a little, gives, gives a little strength to it. And you can see how I'm just doing that careful blending like that. And now for our little, oh, before we get to our little buddy, we've got one, one last flower petal. This is easy. We're going to bring this right in here, nice and light. We don't want to forget about our flower petal here. Mary Ellen, as you're finishing up this painting, I just wanted to thank everybody for joining us today. We have one minute left um, and encourage people to reach out to you with any questions that they might have as well. Absolutely. And what I'm going to do here is I'm going to add, as we're finishing up, I'm going to add that hooker's green onto our, our little friend here and down the back. And you're gonna see all we need to do is, again, let the watercolor do the work. I'm gonna avoid that eye for just a minute. We're gonna get to it. Don't worry, I won't let you go without seeing how I do the eye. We're gonna lift off just a little. And now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take my hooker's green and some of these places I'm just gonna come in and just sort of randomly add dark pigment and lift. Just not a lot, but here and there to give it the texture of the feathers like that. Now, I'm gonna bring this close into that eye I'm going to let that dry for a minute. And Libby, are there any questions that I can answer while I'm putting on the finishing touches? Well, we're right at time. So um, I think that I encourage people to reach out to you via your website if they had questions. And um, I guess basically what brush are you using was one that you could answer quickly. Oh, so this, the whole time I have been using a number eight. The, the entire time I've been using an eight. Thank you. I've never changed it. And I am going to do the eye real quick in the last minute. You're going to notice I'm going to start with the dark value in the center of the eye using the very, very tip. I'm going to leave a little white in the upper far left corner. I want you to think about that. Think about that, that, um, uh, sphere that we drew in the very, very beginning. Everything kind of comes full circle. I'm going to make sure I have that turning shadow. And then I'm also going to leave a sliver and I'll zoom down so you can see it. There's just a sliver of white. If you can, there we go. Just a sliver of white there to give that reflected light on the other side of the eye. And now we've, we've got our little friend and, and their flowers. So it's been such a pleasure and especially to think about warm summer days and hummingbirds and trumpet flowers in the middle of the fall or as we're getting edging toward winter and think a little bit about summer. So I hope you enjoyed today.